Good evening, beloved friends and family. Happy Sabbath. Welcome once again to the Science of Time series. I am your servant, Brother Paul Punch of Clear Distinction Ministries, where we have always desired to inspire you and your family with a timely thirst after Christ, our righteousness, our faithful high priest in the heavenly sanctuary above. Beloved, it is my sincere prayer that this series has been a tremendous benefit to both you and your family throughout the course of these studies. At last, beloved, we have come to the series finale, the conclusion of our study. I can honestly say it has been an honor and a privilege to open the Word of God with you and to look at the various evidences through history, the spirit of prophecy, the Bible, and to see precisely what generation it is to which we have come today. Beloved, I will repeat, even as I have from day one of this series, on the final day of this series, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. We have come to the final generation. We have come to the generation that may expect to see our beloved Savior part the clouds and take us home with him in glory. We have come to the generation that must expect the restoration of every institution given to this body. We have come, beloved, to the generation of restoration that generation that will vindicate the character of God, a generation that is consumed with the thought, not merely of salvation, not merely of translation, but the vindication of the loving character of our God. Beloved, that is the generation to which we have come. We have seen evidence after evidence after evidence after evidence bringing us to this very conclusion. And it is my prayer at this time, beloved, that if you see that this is so, that our hearts, our minds, our families are directed at this time to the only man who can possibly do anything about our spiritual condition. Are we not the church of Laodicea? Yes, we are, beloved. We are the people of the judgment. We are the people expected to vindicate God, to justify God in the judgment. God's character must be made known, beloved, not merely by words in this final generation, but by a living demonstration and example. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness among all nations. And then, beloved, shall the end come. That is the burden of responsibility that rests upon you and I in this final generation. And beloved, dare I say that that burden is easy, that yoke is light, because he who bears the burden for us and in us and through us is Christ our righteousness. It is God, beloved, who worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Psalms 138 and verse 8 tells us that he will perfect that which concerns us. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the work of thine hands. Beloved, however discouraging your current spiritual circumstances may be, However discouraging your own weakness may be, I have come to let you know that in that very weakness, if we surrender, God's strength is made perfect. We have come to the generation that can expect a perfected gospel to do a perfected work in a totally submitted body. Beloved, are we willing to ripen onto Christian character perfection at the end of this antitypical day of atonement. God is willing to take all in his hand who are willing to abide there. And the Bible says that none who the Father gives to Christ will he in any way cast out. None who the Father has given to Christ has he ever lost. He will hold you fast, beloved. Let us hold fast our profession, even as we have from the start of this series. This generation shall not pass. And what that means, beloved, is that we must have an increase in angelic activity around us, an increase in not only the angelic activity that is around us, beloved, but in our cooperation with said angelic activities. We must know 
that God and all of heaven are working with this Advent movement for the purpose of finishing the work, for the purpose of vindicating his character and presenting Christ our righteousness to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. Beloved, these are not my words. We are told in inspiration that one subject will swallow up every other subject, that one interest would prevail, and that is Christ our righteousness. If you believe that we are living in the final generation based on all the evidences that we have looked at in this series, if we really believe that we have come to that generation, then it is time to understand the end of the day of atonement and to present Christ to every and any man who would behold him. And beloved, that is precisely what we intend to do today by God's grace. On our screen, You'll remember, beloved, that earlier on in our series, we spoke about the anatomy or the structure of a clock. And the reason why we did this is because inspiration spoke about God's great clock of time. And we felt that it was wise, beloved, to understand the anatomy of a clock if you're going to do a series such as the science of time. And we found that the structure of any clock includes multiple witnesses, beloved, for the same general purpose of accurately telling the time. We saw that in most clocks, there are at least four witnesses. These witnesses are the face of the clock, the hour hand of the clock, the minute hand, and the second hand of the clock. And all four of these witnesses work together serving the same general purpose of telling the time. We concluded, beloved, that wisdom would utilize the clock in its entirety. I gave the example of a man who had to be at work at 1.30 p.m. That was the time that the man had to be there. Now, in order to get to work on time at 1.30 p.m., you would have to utilize the entirety of the clock to understand when you reach 1.30. But I gave the example of a man who decided he wanted to uh, use the hour hand of the clock, but never mind the minute hand of the clock. Could that man ever accurately know when 1.30 came? No, beloved. He would know when the clock was pointing to 1, but he wouldn't be able to tell if it was 1.10, 1 1.15, 1.45. Do you understand the point? It is necessary in wisdom to utilize the clock in its entirety if you're looking for the most accurate understanding of the time that you can possess. Likewise, beloved, throughout the course of this series, the time that we were seeking to identify was the final generation specified by Jesus in Matthew 24 and verse 34. And we've studied three of these four witnesses. Today, we've come to witness number four. Witness number one, we looked at God's 7,000 year plan of redemption. Witness number two, the four watches and the generations of God's Advent church. Witness number three, the Four Turnings and American History, and today we're going to be covering witness number four, the end of the Day of Atonement. Beloved, all four of these witnesses serve the same general purpose of telling us which generation it is to which we have come, of showing us beyond the shadow of a doubt that this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. We have highlighted from the very offset of this series that we are not after definite time. I don't have a day. I don't have an hour. I don't have a month. I don't have a year for you in which Jesus will come or in which the national Sunday law will pass. But what we do know upon the authority of the word of God and all the evidences that have been gathered here, beloved, is that we have reached the generation that can expect these things to happen in our lifetime. We are here. Our theory, which we were seeking to prove throughout the duration of this series, which I hope many of you now see as the fact of the matter, was that this present generation is the one to which Jesus referred in Matthew 24 and verse 34. We are presently living in the final window of opportunity to fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of God. It is now or never. Sister White's generation was now or later, that first generation, but we are living in the generation where it is now or never to vindicate the character of God and to present the message of Christ our righteousness to every nation, kindred, tongue, 
and people accurately by the grace of God. We're going to spend some time now, beloved, going through the first three witnesses of the series. I'm not going to study them with you here. We've studied them already. Amen. But I am going to bring up certain key points that we brought up as we went through these uh, witnesses. Witness number one, God's 7,000 year plan of restoration. In the book, Education, page 125, we were told the central theme of the Bible The theme about which every other in the whole book clusters is the redemption plan, the restoration in the human soul of the image of God. What is the plan of redemption according to this statement? It is the restoration in the human soul of the image or the character of God. In other words, beloved, the redemption plan is God's plan of restoration. Do you see that? The burden of every book and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme. He who grasps this thought has before him an infinite field for study. He has, what are those words? The key that will unlock to him the whole treasure house of God's word. In other words, beloved, the fact that every book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is centered on this redemption plan, centered on God's restoration plan, is the key that unlocks to us the entire treasure house of God's word. If you're in the book of Genesis or anywhere in between there and Revelation, you should know that you are looking to see how it is that God restores his image his character through the presentation of the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus said, search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. In other words, beloved, there is no eternal life in the scriptures apart from the man that scripture was always seeking to bring to the forefront. That is Christ, our righteousness. He is the life eternal that we've been seeking. John 17 verse 3 says, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Beloved, we have to get to know God through the man Christ Jesus. This is what uh, A.T. Jones meant when he said that the teacher of righteousness, that message of justification by faith, which came in the year 1888, can only ever be received in accordance with God's idea of righteousness. You see, it's not a teacher of righteousness and that's it. It is a teacher of righteousness according to what righteousness actually looks like. God's idea of his character has always been Jesus. And as long as we understand this, beloved, we have the key that unlocks the entire treasure house of God's word. Question number one. What is God's original purpose for man? The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter one, verses 26 through 27, that God made man in his image. In other words, beloved, when God created the human family, there was something about himself that he was seeking to make known to all who were watching. In fact, Romans chapter one and verse 20 will make that point emphatically clear to us. We're looking to understand what is God's purpose in creating man. God said he made us in his image. Amen. And throughout this series, we've seen that in the final generation, we would be recreated in his express image, the man, Christ Jesus. Romans chapter one, beginning at verse 20, the Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, are clearly seen. Let's pause there for a moment just to see what God is saying here. You have to take this text piece by piece in order to grasp the picture. The Apostle Paul said, beloved, that there were invisible things of him, that is God, that were to be clearly seen from the creation of the world. In other words, beloved, there were some invisible things about God, some things that were not previously seen that God was seeking to put on display before the entire heavenly universe. And in order to do that, he created our world. Somebody may be asking, what could possibly have been invisible about God? What do we mean by that? Beloved, God is agape love. 
those of you who study the Bible, you know exactly what we're talking about. God is self-sacrificing love. There is no selfishness. There is no pride. There is no sin in God. Amen? He is agape love. He has always been self-sacrificing, selfless. We know that this has always been so because the Bible says, I am the Lord God, I change not. There is nothing that can be seen today about God that was not true about God from the very beginning of the controversy and even before the great controversy. If you see God even one time accurately, beloved, you learn who he has always been, you learn who he will always be, and that is the significance of seeing God the correct way only one time. God is self-sacrificing love. Now, what's interesting about that, beloved, is prior to the entrance of sin, did the angels know that God was self-sacrificing? Had they ever seen that? You see, prior to sin, there was no need for self-sacrifice in the, uh, the context of the cross because there was no such thing as death. But when sin entered in, it provided a unique opportunity. I did not say an ordained opportunity. There's a difference. Amen. It provided a unique opportunity for God to display that which was always true concerning his character, yet was invisible to all that were around him. So when sin came in now, the cross provided the opportunity for God to show, to demonstrate that there is selflessness with God. There is the consideration of everybody but himself with God. That is his character. That is agape love. The invisible things, the Bible says, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being, keyword, understood by the things that are made. So God is not only interested in us seeing what is true about him. God wants us to actually understand what is the truth concerning his character. What is God really like? Even his eternal power and Godhead, beloved, so that they are without excuse. All of these things that we find here in this text, God created the human family to, to display the truth that we may understand the truth of these things. This is the purpose of the creation of man. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, God said, let there be light. Those were the first words, beloved, that God uttered over this planet. In other words, those words contain within them the priority of God concerning humanity. Let there be light. Now, we studied in last study and we saw that the earth was darkened through misapprehension of God. The very planet that was created to display that others may understand what God is like was darkened through a misapprehension of what God is actually like. Now, Genesis 1 verses 1 through 3 in telling us that let there be light, God was not speaking, beloved, concerning the celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, or the stars. We know this because when you read the Genesis account, you see that it wasn't until day four that God created any of those celestial bodies. In other words, beloved, what are we saying? The light that God uh, prioritized for man was not determined or... or uh, dependent rather on the sun or the moon or the stars. Very important point. Because in these last days, beloved, there are those who think God needs the sun in order to get people to worship him. God does not need a national Sunday law. It is coming, but beloved, God does not need it. He has never needed the light of the sun to light this planet. All we need is Christ, our righteousness. In fact, the Bible says in John chapter one, verses one, through uh, five. In Christ, speaking of the word who was in the beginning, in Christ was life and the life was the light of men. So when God said, let there be light in Genesis chapter one, beloved, he was not speaking over this planet, a desire for us merely to have the sun, moon, and stars. Those came on day four. He was prioritizing the knowledge of the life of God that is demonstrated in the life of Christ. That has always been the light of the world. And it is he, beloved, that lighteth every man that comes into this world. 
God's plan, God's priority, God's purpose in creating man has always been that we should walk in light and not in darkness. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, the Bible says, let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. In other words, we were created for this purpose to fear God and to keep his commandments. Remember, those commandments are a transcript of God's character. In other words, we were made to live like God. We were made to demonstrate his character, his character of love. We were made to be patient. We were made to be long-suffering. We were made to be kind. We were made to be joyful and to have peace. We were made to demonstrate agape, selfless, self-sacrificing, other-centered love, beloved. That is the reason why God made us. Amen? That is the reason why he made this planet. Why did God create our world in seven days? We saw, beloved, from Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 10, that God was declaring the end of all things from the beginning of the creation of this world. When God created this world in six days and rested on the seventh, he was typifying the way that he would finish the work in 6,000 years and that we would rest with him that 7,000th year in the Feast of Tabernacles in heaven. We've studied this. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 said, Beloved, I would not have you ignorant of this one thing, that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So when you're looking at the creation week, those seven literal days typify seven thousand years in which God would complete the work of salvation in six and he would take us home to rest with him for one seven thousand year plan amen in Psalms chapter 102 verses 18 through 21 the Bible said that there would come a generation beloved I believe it is this very one that would live in the sight of a holy God while Jesus was working in the sanctuary above and that generation would be created, a generation that would be created, beloved, dare I even say, recreated in the image of God, restored in the image of God, so that God's character could be made known to all the universe by the lives we display in this final generation. We saw in the great controversy that this war between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years is soon to close. And the wicked one redoubles his efforts to defeat the work of Christ in man's behalf and to fasten souls in his snares, to hold the people in what? Darkness. What is darkness again, beloved? The earth was darkened through misapprehension of God. Satan does not want us to have an accurate picture of the character of God. That is what he's seeking to do, to hold the people in darkness and impenitence or sin until, beloved, the Savior's mediation is ended and there is no longer a sacrifice for sin is the object which he seeks to accomplish. Beloved, Satan knows that at the end of 6,000 years, this great controversy will come to a close. The Savior's mediation in the sanctuary above will be ended. He will utter the words, it is finished. Let he that is filthy be filthy still. Let he that is unholy be unholy still. Let he that is righteous be righteous still. That is the generation to which we have come. Satan knows that he has but a short time. He's aware of this and his efforts at this time are to hold us in the misapprehension of God's character, that darkness and in sin, that impenitence until the Savior's mediation is ended at the end of 6,000 years. We saw that at the end of 6,000 years, beloved, all have made their decisions either for or against Christ. In other words, at the end of 6,000 years, you either have the mark of the beast or you have the seal of God. The generation that comes to the 6,000th year is the generation that will face the mark of the beast crisis. She says now at the end of 6,000 years, all have made their decisions. The wicked have fully united with Satan in his warfare against God. The time has come for God to vindicate the authority of his downtrodden law, beloved 6,000 years and the controversy has ended. In the Adventist home, we're told the great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. In other words, restoring us, beloved, in the image of God. 
all that was lost by sin is keyword restored. Again, beloved, the plan of redemption is God's restoration plan. What generation are we living in? The generation of restoration. The generation, beloved, that will see the end of the great plan of redemption, the end of the antitypical day of atonement. I pray that you're understanding this. She says, for 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now, beloved, when is now? At the end of 6,000 years. Now, God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. At the end of 6,000 years, God will restore in us his image, his character, his righteousness, just in time for the second coming of Jesus. Beloved, this is wonderful stuff that we're looking at here. 6,000 years on earth until full restoration and the second coming of Jesus. Turn with me in the Bible to Acts chapter 3. We're turning in our Bible to the book of Acts chapter 3 to see what the uh, Apostle Peter had to say about the second coming of Jesus. Beloved, we're living in the generation of restoration. Amen? We've seen it and we're going to go through it again. We've seen it throughout the course of this series. I want us to understand that being in the generation of restoration in this Advent movement, the very movement that was raised up on October 22nd, 1844, 179 years ago, uh, tomorrow or this, this evening, this uh, sunset. Being in that generation, beloved, is highly significant. Highly significant. Acts chapter 3, the Apostle Peter tells us, beginning at verse 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be what? Blotted out. This is day of atonement language, beloved. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until... Now notice, beloved, the apostle Peter says that Jesus would be received into heaven until a particular time. Jesus is not going to stay in heaven forever. He has a people to come back and receive. Do you see that? A people who have had their sins blotted out when the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord came, that latter rain message, that teacher of righteousness according to the righteousness of God. The Bible says, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Beloved, if you look at the margin in your Bible, you will see that that word restitution means restoration. It means that Jesus Christ would be received into heaven and he would come again to receive a body who have had their sins blotted out in the time of restoration. Again, I ask, beloved, what generation have we come to in this Advent movement? We are living in the generation of restoration. It began in 2004. I'm going to show you this again. We've studied this already. Okay, so again, we're not, we're not studying it in depth right now. I'm literally telling you things that we've already studied, just so that we can overview. On our screen, we have various pioneers of this movement, beloved, who all taught this first witness of God's 7,000 year plan of restoration. And according to these pioneers, beloved, the events that were associated with the 6,000th year were number one, the end of the Savior's mediation in heaven, or in other words, when Michael stands up, probation closes. Number two, that all people have made their final decisions by then. In other words, they are sealed or they're marked. Number three, God will then, at the end of 6,000 years, vindicate the authority of his downtrodden law. Number four, God's original purpose for Earth's creation is accomplished by that time. Number five, the last generation lives in the sight of a holy God without a mediator in heaven. Solemn thought, beloved, at the end of 6,000 years. Number six, the end of the controversy is finally reached and the truth is triumphant. Number seven, this is the short time. Satan has to work his rebellion on earth. It is the time he knows, specified in Revelation chapter 12. Number eight, this 6,000 years spans the entire controversy on earth, beginning with the day that Adam sinned in Eden until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Number nine, that generation 
which reaches the 6,000th year, sees Jesus return in the clouds. And number 10, the beginning of the millennium in heaven prior to the final destruction of sin and sinners begins at that 6,000th year point. This we have all seen from our studies in this series. We took a look at the plan of redemption as outlined in the sanctuary, beloved. Outer court, holy place, most holy place. And we saw that the outer court symbolized Christ's work on earth. And the inner court, or holy and most holy places, represented Christ's work in heaven. The work typified in these services, beloved, represented a total of 6,000 years until Christ's second coming for the 1,000-year Feast of Tabernacles in heaven. We saw that in 31 AD, beloved, according to the book of Daniel, Christ ascended to the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, and he was there from 31 AD until the year 1844 on October 22nd when he moved from the holy place into the most holy place. That is a definite total of 1,813 years. This is a definitive time frame for how long Jesus was in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. We know, beloved, from the book of Daniel chapter 9, that it was in 31 AD, in that final week, in the midst of that final week of Jewish probation, that Christ the Messiah was cut off, not for himself, but for the entire world, for you and for me. We know that in 31 AD, on the third day, beloved, on that Sunday morning, Jesus resurrected from the tomb. We know from the word of God that it was 40 days that he was with the disciples until he ascended up to heaven, okay? And 10 days after that on Pentecost or the 50th day from his crucifixion, the gift of the Holy Spirit came down because he was anointed as high priest in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That is what we know. 1,813 definite years can be calculated in that way from 31 AD until the year 1844 when he moved into the most holy place and he has been there to this very day for 179 definite years. But when it came to the outer court time, beloved, we saw that we have no definitive time. The reason being, we don't have a date, beloved, for the day that Adam fell. We simply do not. God has not revealed that information to us. We know that in 31 AD, the outer work court uh, work came to its end, that he caused all sacrificing and oblation to cease with his crucifixion. He moved now into the holy place work, but we do not have a starting point for the outer court work. We only know, beloved, that it began on the day that Adam turned his back in Eden. That being said, in confrontation, we saw that Christ in the wilderness of temptation, a grown man of 30 years old, beloved, stood in Adam's place to bear the test he failed to endure. Here, in the wilderness, Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf how long? 4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of his home. Based on this, beloved, some would be tempted to say that the outer court time frame was a definite 4,000 years, but we see that that cannot be so. Because in the Desire of Ages, we were told that the story of Bethlehem, when Christ was a baby, is an exhaustless theme. It says that Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by how many years? 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. The work of the outer court was about 4,000 years when Jesus showed up. The reason we say about, beloved, is because if in one place it says when he was a grown man in the wilderness, 4,000 years had passed. And then in another place it says in the story of Bethlehem when he was only a baby, 4,000 years had passed. Can we not see that inspiration was never trying to give us a definitive time for the outer court work? We're not given a definitive time, beloved, because God is not seeking for us to understand the day, the hour, or the year in which he will come this side of probation. And so we saw that about 4,000 years had passed in the outer court from Adam's fall until 31 AD with the crucifixion of Jesus on that cross. We saw, beloved, that if you were to add the definite time from the holy place beginning in 31 AD until present day 2023 onto the approximate time of 4,000 years found in the outer court, you would see that approximately 
5,992 years are already accomplished out of the 6,000 years that are necessary prior to the second coming of Jesus. Which would leave us, beloved, with approximately, again, we are not dealing with definite time. We are looking at the fact that this is the generation in which the second coming will occur. Jesus said we should understand as much. Matthew 24, verse 34. Approximately eight years are left until the end of the day of atonement. Beloved, this is the generation that shall see the restoration of all things, the fulfillment of the great plan of redemption. That being said, witness number two, the generations of Seventh-day Adventism and the watches. We saw, beloved, from the Bible that a biblical generation is equivalent to 40 years. And we looked at the 40-year concept within the generations of this movement, from the first all the way down to this generation. We saw that in the first generation, from 1844 until 40 years later, in the year 1884, God had given us all of the fundamental pillars of our faith. It was in the most holy place that we met him in that generation, beloved. And as we met him, we, we were restored to the sanctuary truth that had been lost because of 1260 years of papal darkness. We were restored to the law of God. We were restored to the health message, the spirit of prophecy, the seventh day Sabbath. Amen. But by the 1850s forward, beloved, we saw that a lukewarm legalistic condition crept into God's church. By 1863, Seventh-day Adventism was organized as an official body, and we concluded that if in 1850 forward we had been dealing with a lukewarm legalistic condition, then Seventh-day Adventism, organized as we have come to know it, has always struggled with a lukewarm legalistic condition. Beloved, we need a remedy from our legalism, a remedy from our lukewarmness, and the only one there is came in the second generation of this movement. In the year 1888, during the second generation of this movement, beloved, God sent the latter rain message, the message of Christ and his righteousness at that Minneapolis General Conference session through A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. Now we know that the message was not uh, received by the leading men at that time. There were many who were in opposition to it. And this opposition, beloved, resulted in the spiritual decline that we today see among Seventh-day Adventists. Very serious stuff we're talking about here. By the third generation, 1924 to 1964, we had champions such as M. L. Andreasen, beloved, who teach the sanctuary doctrine from the Bible and the truth concerning the final generation in the anti-typical Day of Atonement setting proving that we need victory over sin, everything cultivated, everything hereditary, we must give it up to our faithful high priest at this time. That is what the man taught. But in the third generation, men such as Heppenstall came in, beloved, and began to uh, be antagonistic to the message of God. All of these things transpired because of the rejection that took place in the second generation of the message of Christ and his righteousness. Do you know that it is impossible to struggle and argue against any man that preaches victory over sin from the Bible if you have an accurate understanding of justification by faith? Justification by faith, beloved, is the victory. That is the only victory that overcomes the world. And so if we had received that remedy, which came in 1888 through those two men, by God's grace, we would never have had to deal with the degradation that resulted from men such as Heppenstall, Froome, Anderson, or Desmond Ford, and there are others that can be named. We saw that in the 1930s through the 1950s, beloved, the final generation theology, biblical theology, dare I say, praise God, the nature of Jesus Christ, victory over sin, and the investigative judgment were all opposed. By the fourth generation, which began in 1964, we had men such as Desmond Ford, who was responsible from the 1970s forward of the investigative judgment, the sanctuary, and all the other key doctrines of our faith being opposed. These were the first four generations of this Advent movement, beloved, and we saw from the Bible that it is in God's character to visit the iniquity of the fathers unto the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. God was consistently merciful, beloved, 
consistently gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and in truth. From the first generation all the way down to this generation, there was no change in God, but there was evidently a change and a decline in the spiritual condition of his church because of the misuse that we made of the advantages he afforded us. When God sends you a message, beloved, it is not for you and I to pick and choose which aspects of the message we enjoy and want to apply to our lives. We don't get to choose one or the other and put the truth against itself. We have to receive the truth in its totality as he sent it. Praise God. Praise God. We saw that failure to appreciate these gifts, beloved, produced a woeful harvest in the third and the fourth generation of this movement. So much so that we were told we may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years. Is 2023 many more years from the first generation? Yes, it is, beloved. Many more years, even as the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequences of their own wrong course of action. Beloved, we concluded that all of the degradation which we have seen is the fruit of our insubordination as a people. And like Daniel, beloved, in the book of Daniel chapter 9, we have to come to a place where we're not pointing the finger at other ministers, pointing the finger at anybody else but ourselves and saying, Lord, have mercy on us, your people. We are all in this together. Yes, it is true. We are saved as individuals, but there is no individual, beloved, who can possibly be saved except he is uh, experiencing and expressing the brotherly love that flowed from the heart of Jesus. We have to be praying for those we know are in error, sighing and crying, the Bible says, for the abominations that are going on in the midst of us. That does not mean we make a, a, a career out of exposing men, okay? That's not what that means. It means we make a career out of uplifting Jesus and pointing these sin-sick souls, all of us, beloved, to the only remedy there has ever been. Is there need to expose sin in this final generation. Yes, there is, beloved. And dare I say there is greater need to expose the people of God to the only righteousness there is in the universe. I will not cease to direct your eyes to the man Christ Jesus at this time, nor will I turn a blind eye by God's grace, beloved, to any of the apostasy that is going on around me. We must sigh and cry together and direct the eyes of the people to the remedy himself. There is a bomb in the most holy place, amen? And we need his help today. We ask the question concerning this generation, beloved, who are we? What does the Bible say of this generation? We saw that iniquity ripens, beloved. That is the behavior of time, resulting in spiritual degradation and judgment upon the third and fourth generation. And that one cycle of sowing and reaping is four generations, which totals 160 years. When we talk about one cycle of sowing and reaping, we are talking about the time it takes, beloved, for any people to reap the results of either accepting or rejecting the truth that God has sent to that body. That's what we're talking about, a cycle of sowing and reaping. In the book of Joel chapter one, beloved, we saw that these four generations were called the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar generations. And we saw in the margin of our Bibles that all of these creepy crawly things, these pests, as it were, were simply different names for locust in different stages of development. The first generation or palmer worm generation was characterized by the chewing locust. The second by the swarming locust, the third by the crawling locust, and the fourth by the consuming locust. Meaning, beloved, that by the fourth generation, if it weren't for what God has done with this generation, all that he has ever committed to this movement would be consumed entirely until there is nothing left. Even as when Joshua died, beloved, there came a generation, the Bible says, who knew not the Lord. Beloved, if God were to allow the generation that exists currently to take the reins in its own hand, God have mercy on this movement. 
But inspiration says, beloved, that God is going to take the reins into his own hands in this generation. So the question we asked, beloved, was what does the Bible say about us? The first, second, third, and fourth generation have all passed off of the scene in their numerical sequence. We are currently living in this generation, which some refer to as the fifth, but what does the Bible call this generation? We turn to Joel chapter 2 and we saw, beloved, that the Bible says, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain, in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the cankerworm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. And so we saw, beloved, that the generation which comes after these four, the locust, the cankerworm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm generations, that generation is the generation that God says he will restore all things unto them. We have come to what the Bible calls the generation of restoration, which began in 2004 when the fourth generation closed, and it will end in 2044. Now, if you've been following on in the series, beloved, we do not believe that we're gonna make it all the way to 2044. I don't believe that in 2044, we're gonna be having a study such as this ever again. I don't believe it. I believe God is gonna cut it short in righteousness. I don't have a definite time for you for that. I just know we're in the generation in which it will happen. God is going to do this in no unsure way. He's going to do in this generation precisely what he did in the first. In the first generation, he introduced himself to us. In this final generation, there will be a revelation of him because we've lost sight of Jesus Christ. The Bible calls us in Isaiah chapter 58, the repairers of the breach, the restorers of paths to dwell in, beloved. That is this generation. And in Christ's object lessons, we're told that the last rays of merciful light, the last or final message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. God's character is to be made known in this final generation, beloved. Dealing with the watches, we saw historically that God has always set his watchmen among his people to guard, wake up, and warned them of incoming danger. And we were studying the watches, beloved, with reference to the midnight event of a national Sunday law. Are we near? Yes, we are. Do we have a definitive date for when? No, we do not. Were we looking for one? No, we were not, beloved. But we're aware that this generation shall see that event. Are, are, we, are we clear? Praise God. In the days of Christ, there were how many watches? Four watches of the night. And they were evenly divided. Beloved, that was a key point in the study of the watches. When you're talking about the four watches of the night, Jesus said that there were how many hours in the night? 12 hours. And if there are 12 hours in the night, how many hours are there of necessity in the day? 12 hours. This is where we get the 24 hour day period. Does it make sense? But in those 12 hours of the night, Jesus said that there were four watches. The evening watch, the midnight watch, the cock crowing watch, and the morning watch. These four watches, beloved, are evenly divided within the 12 hours of the night, meaning that each of these watches were three hours in duration. And when we took that principle of evenly applying the watches in the watches of the night to the generations now, we saw that if a generation is 40 years and there are four watches in a generation, then each watch must be a period of 10 years within each generation. Is it clear? Applying that principle, beloved, we saw from inspiration that that is the accurate way to look at the watches. We looked at this generation and saw that the first or evening watch began in 2004 at the start of this generation and concluded in the year 2014. The second watch, or midnight watch, began in 2014, and it will conclude next year, October 22nd, 2024. We are living in that watch, the midnight watch, the second watch of this generation. 
The third Akat Coin Watch, beloved, begins in 2024 next year, and it concludes in 2034. And the fourth or morning watch would begin in 2034 until 2044, if we ever get there. We are here in 2023, beloved, and we ask the question, is there biblical significance to this? We saw that there is biblical significance because the second and third watches of these generations, beloved, are highly significant according to the words of Christ, found in the book of Luke chapter 12, where he said there was a blessing pronounced on those he would find watching if he should come in the second or the third watch. Jesus' desire is to come in the second or the third watch. What watch are we living in currently? We are in the second watch, the midnight watch of this final generation. Beloved, we took time and studied how Jesus spent his final midnight watch before that midnight event when he was seized by the mob and dragged off before Caiaphas and the priests, uh, the Pharisees, did we not? I pray that we are spending the hours of this midnight watch in the same way. Beloved, there is only one year left in this midnight watch as of sunset today. When the sun sets today, beloved, we would have entered into October 22nd of 2023, the beginning of the final year of this midnight watch. I pray that we're watching and I pray that we're getting ready. Jesus can come in this watch or the next watch. Dare I say Jesus wants to come back in this watch, beloved, or in the next watch. The question is, are we going to cooperate with him? Beloved, I told you already, this generation is not now or later. This generation is now or never. So whether or not we choose to be on board somewhere on God's green earth, somebody is ripening to Christian character perfection. The only question is, will we be a part of that number? By the grace of God, I have determined to have the blood of the lamb on my doorpost. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord all throughout this last year of the midnight watch. And when we enter, should we enter by God's grace into the cock crowing watch, we will serve him the whole duration of however much time we have left. Beloved, we will not by the grace of God, cease to follow the Lamb. That is what we desire. And that is what we desire for you and your family at this time as well. We cannot afford to waste our time looking upon any man except the man who is in the most holy place at this time. He wants to come out. Let's let him come out. What do you say? Witness number three, beloved, we studied the four turnings and American history. And we saw from the Desire of Ages, beloved, that as far as their teaching is true, do the world's great thinking men reflect the rays of the Son of Righteousness. And we started talking about some of these thinking men, beloved, only so much as what they were saying was true. We weren't looking to gather everything that the thinking men of the world said, and just because they have PhDs behind their name, adapt it into our faith. No, we did not, beloved. We looked at what they were saying, and we asked the question, what does history, the Bible, and the spirit of prophecy have to say? And we took only that which was applicable, and we left anything else. Amen? This man, by the name of General Lieutenant Sir John Glubb, wrote this book, The Fate of Empires and Search for Survival. A brief description. In this 1976 essay, The Fate of Empires, General Sir John Glubb analyzed the life cycles of civilizations. He found remarkable similarities between them all. Most have lasted around 250 years. That is not a definite time, beloved. It is an approximate time. And each has passed through clearly identifiable stages. Glubb calls these the six ages of empire. We ask the question, if inspiration agrees, beloved, that there is a life cycle for civilizations, a life cycle for nations and empires. And we saw that there is, in fact, a limit. God keeps a reckoning with nations, as well as with individuals. He allows to nations a certain period of probation. Do you see that? And we saw that when the iniquity is full, as in the case of the Amorites, God takes the matter in hand and his judgments are not longer withheld. We saw that God keeps a reckoning with the nations. When the time fully comes, beloved, that iniquity shall have reached the stated boundary or limit of God's mercy, his forbearance will cease. There is a limit beyond which men may not go in sin. 
And when that limit is reached, then the offers of mercy are withdrawn and the ministration of judgment begins. And we saw, beloved, that each nation, each empire reaches that stated boundary based on what they do with the light that has come their way. It varies from nation to nation and thus each nation ripens according to the behavior of time in accordance with what they have done with that light. The great controversy said, such are the judgments that fall upon Babylon in the days of the visitation of God's wrath. She has filled up the measure of her iniquity. Her time, beloved, has come. She is ripe for destruction. And so we saw, beloved, that the time or the limit of each nation is set by their own rejection or acceptance of righteous principles as sent by God to them. They are ripening for destruction in rejecting the light. I gave the example of these wonderful mangoes, and we saw, beloved, that the mangoes vary. You have the honey mango, the Kent mango, the Hayden mango, the Tommy Atkins, the Francis mango. All of these mangoes vary, beloved, and they ripen in accordance with their environment, they ripen in accordance with the treatment of the mango, okay? Do you know that if you pluck a mango from a tree and you place it in your fridge, that you are delaying the ripening process? There are certain things that can be done to hasten or to delay the ripening process in the case of mangoes. The same is true concerning the nations, beloved. The same is true. And so we saw, beloved, that the time of ripening varies from nation to nation and is dependent on certain conditions, just as seen in the story of Jonah with Nineveh. Inspiration told us, beloved, that it is beyond the power of human minds to define the amount of guilt that God allows not to be passed. The thinking men may say about or around 250 years, but they could never definitively say this is the amount because of the behavior of time. And so this thinking man said that there was an average of 250 years for the lifespan of every civilization and every nation. And we asked the question, if the history be true, then what does this indicate concerning the United States of America today? And we saw on basic articles, beloved, here in the United States of America, that the thinking men here, the politicians here, and many Protestants here believe that America is headed to a crisis right now believe that the anniversary of the 250th year is upon this nation and they have set certain plans in order that they may avert the crisis, beloved. We saw many different things, did we not? Yes, we did. 1776, this country got its independence. 250 years later would bring us to what year? 2026. We learned about this book here, The Fourth Turning, by William Strauss and Neil Howe. And in this book, they spoke about a four-stage cycle they noticed repeating in history here in America. Now, beloved, the Bible says that the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and there is nothing new under the sun. So is there a principle here that can be understood? Is there something to the history that we should acknowledge? Yes, there is, beloved, and that's why we looked at it. And the fourth turning, what they call the crisis, would begin in 2025, beloved, and conclude in the year 2045. Now that was interesting because we spoke about Project 2025 and the 2025 mandate for leadership, the conservative promise. In these United States of America, we saw, beloved, that apostate Protestantism is making a move upon government even now, that Congress should legislate Sunday laws in this land. Beloved, we saw that. The mark of the beast crisis of Revelation chapter 13 is just upon us. That which this de denomination for years has been prophesying is right upon us. And sadly, there are many ministers who seeing this are still silent at this time, but not at Clear Distinction Ministries by the grace of God. We saw the 2025 mandate for leadership, the conservative promise, beloved, and we, we spoke a little bit about that seeing the connection with this fourth turning that these thinking men and politicians are seeking to avert this crisis. Which brings us today, beloved, to witness number four, the end of the day of atonement. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, we read, And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, and the tabernacle of the congregation, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat 
and Aaron, beloved, who typifies Christ in this sense, shall lay both of his hands upon the head of the live goat. You should be thinking Genesis 3.15 right now. And confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. Jesus takes all of our iniquity, all of our transgression, all of our sin, beloved. And if he takes all these things from us, he has a sinless generation at the end of the day of atonement. Do you see it? This is final generation theology from the Bible, beloved. You, you don't let any man throw you off of Bible truth by using fancy terminologies uh, uh, and, and making various jabs at the truth of God. Stand upon the word of God as it was once delivered unto this body. We are standing on solid ground. The end of the day of atonement leaves a sinless generation for Jesus to return and to receive. And he puts all of these things upon the head of the scapegoat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man. What kind of man, beloved? A fit man into the wilderness. And the goat, which represents Satan, shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat into the wilderness. Now, beloved, once Jesus has this sinless generation, what does he do with our sin? He lays it on the head of the scapegoat, representing Satan. He lays it on the head of the scapegoat, not the tail or the back, but the head, because in Genesis 3.15, the promise was that the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, would crush the Satan's head. When you go to Romans 16 and verse 20, beloved, the apostle Paul, after Calvary, stated that the God of peace would bruise Satan under your feet, speaking to the church, shortly. Jesus began the crushing on Golgotha, on Golgotha, the place of a skull, but he finishes the crushing of Satan's head at the end of the anti-typical day of atonement because a body has been prepared. The remnant of her seed has been prepared to cooperate with the seed of Genesis 3.15 in crushing the head of Satan at this time. Do you see it? And when he does so, beloved, he takes all those sins, puts them on the head of the scapegoat, thus crushing Satan's head at long last. And he leads him by the hand of a fit man into a land not inhabited. What is the condition of the earth? At the end of the day of atonement, according to Leviticus 16, it becomes a land not inhabited. Beloved, please catch what I am saying to you because we're talking about the end of the day of atonement in these final moments of this conclusion of the series. Those words, beloved, the fit man, in Strong's Concordance is the word iti. And it is a Hebrew word meaning the timely or the ready man. In other words, beloved, at the end of the day of atonement, someone comes right on time in order to place all of our sins on the head of Satan, the scapegoat, right on time. At the end of 6,000 years, beloved, the timely man comes for Satan. Revelation chapter 20 gives us the picture. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. Those words, bottomless pit, beloved, are talking about a land uninhabited. There is nobody alive at the end of the day of atonement. The wicked are destroyed with the brightness of the coming of the Lord. Those who were dead in Christ have been resurrected. Those who are alive are caught up and remain with him forever in the clouds. There is nobody alive on this planet except Satan and his angels during that entire millennium, that entire thousand years, that 7,000th year of the plan of redemption. And at the end of 6,000 years, the generation that reaches that point, 
they must be expecting that Jesus is coming back to see a land not inhabited. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? If what I'm saying is true, beloved, now, now before I even get to that point, let's look at more biblical evidences. Let's look at more biblical evidences. What condition is the earth in at that time, at the end of 6,000 years, at the end of the Day of Atonement? At the coming of Christ, which is at the end of 6,000 years, beloved, the wicked are blotted from the face of the whole earth, consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed by the brightness of his glory. Christ takes his people to the city of God and the earth is emptied of its inhabitants. Just like Leviticus 16 said, do you see that? Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned. In other words, beloved, the universal apostasy of a national Sunday law will lead to universal ruin. So terrible that by the time Jesus comes to receive us and take us home, beloved, the earth is going to be emptied of its inhabitants. The earth is going to be left in the condition typified by the day of atonement service. It says that the whole earth appears like a desolate wilderness, just like Leviticus 16. The ruins of cities and villages destroyed by the earthquake uprooted trees, ragged rocks thrown down out of the sea or torn out of the earth itself are scattered over its surface, while vast caverns mark the spot where the mountains have been rent from their foundations. Now, beloved, or at that time, at the end of 6,000 years, the event takes place foreshadowed in the last solemn service of the Day of Atonement, and as the scapegoat was sent away into a land not inhabited, so Satan will be banished to the desolate earth, an uninhabited and dreary wilderness. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6, Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities have been wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without men and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Jeremiah says, the sea is come up upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. Her cities are a desolation, a dry land, and a wilderness, a land wherein no man dwelleth neither doth any son of man pass thereby. And in Isaiah 24, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth, what? Empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land shall be utterly emptied, beloved, and utterly spoiled. For the Lord hath spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. We are talking about a land not inhabited by the end of the day of atonement. Beloved, if we believe that we are the final generation, if we believe that we are the generation that will see the 6,000th year, whatever year that may be, if we believe, beloved, that we are the generation that will see the passing of a national Sunday law and that national apostasy will be followed by national ruin, then we must believe we are the generation that will see the end of the antitypical day of atonement. And if that is so, beloved, we are the generation that can expect the earth to reach a condition where no man inhabits it. What are we talking about? What are we talking about, beloved? I want you to see that what I'm saying right now, in fact, let me amend that statement. I want you to see that what inspiration is saying right now is exactly what the thinking men of the world foresee in the near future. They just don't understand it in the context of the anti-typical day of atonement. The question is, as a Seventh-day Adventist, do you? Are we merely eventists looking for the latest event and jumping on the bandwagon? Or do we actually recognize the connection between all that we are seeing right now 
and the work of Jesus coming to an end in the most holy place. Follow on, beloved. I want you to see that the thinking men are talking about precisely what the end of the Day of Atonement looks like just ahead of us. And many of us don't even realize it. On our screen, beloved, we talked about the handwriting on the wall and how the thinking men of the world, thinking men of women of all classes, beloved, have their attention fixed upon the events that are taking place about us. They are watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe, beloved, the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element, and they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. I wonder what they see. They see COVID-19, beloved. The thinking men see climate change. They saw the U.S. Capitol siege. They see Trump's impeachment, beloved, and they see now Project 2025 encroaching upon this government of the United States of America. I want you to see that they also see the end of the Day of Atonement, even though they don't use that language. From the United Nations, beloved, in the year 2022, we were told, it is now or never to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. This was written April 4th, 2022. They said that the world will be, keyword, uninhabitable, beloved. They said the world would become what, beloved? Uninhabitable. Is that not the very condition that we would come to at the end of 6,000 years, at the end of the antitypical day of atonement? Yes, beloved, they see it. They see that the time is upon us, but they don't know what it means. Seventh-day Adventists, are you waking up? Do you see your need at this time? They said, unless action is taken soon, some of the major cities, beloved, would be destroyed. Do we not have a message, beloved, that calls God people out of Babylon, out of these wicked cities, because the seven last plagues are going to be poured out and destroy these wicked cities because of their apostasy? Yes, we do. Continuing, the United Nation chief added, this is not fiction or exaggeration, beloved. It is what science tells us will result from our current energy policies. At the bottom of this article, they said that we would have to make some changes, beloved, or there would be irreversible climate effects. Do you see that? They said, we are at a crossroads. The decisions we make now can secure a guess what? livable future. And we need to take action by when? 2025 at the latest. And they said it is now or never. Beloved, the thinking men of the world sound like they've been watching the Science of Time series, but they have not. They are speaking merely from their scientific findings, from their historic findings, beloved. And whether or not we believe what we have studied in this Science of Time series is the truth, the thinking men of the world would tell you, you are out of your mind if you don't see these things on the horizon. Now, it's interesting. They mentioned that action needs to be taken by 2025 at the latest. That's what the United Nations said. But the United Nations, were they talking about Project 2025? No, they were not, beloved. It's interesting how all the pieces are coming together on the board right now, and as we're getting nearer to the event, we can see clearer and clearer and clearer where we are heading, even though we don't have a definitive time. They don't even know what they're talking about, but they're talking about the same general area of time. Do you see that? In the great controversy, beloved, this issue of climate change is put into its appropriate context with relation to the final crisis and the end of the Day of Atonement. We need to see this because the thinking men of the world right now are being prepared by the enemy of souls. They want to do the right thing to save the planet, but they're about to adopt a method that is not going to work. A method, beloved, that is going to ripen every nation on this planet for the destruction of the seven last plagues and the rejection of the third angel's message, the rejection of the loud cry. In the Great Controversy, on page 589, we're told, while appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, Satan will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now, beloved, he is at work. In accidents and calamities, by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, what is that, beloved? 
fires? Did we not recently see the Maui fires? Yes, beloved, these things are by design. Satan is behind it, and there's an agenda behind it. In great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes, the list goes on, beloved, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint. I believe he did so, beloved, with COVID-19. And thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations, beloved, are to become less and less. Is that what we're told? No, beloved, do not fool yourself. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. Beloved, I want you to understand that these things that are coming upon the earth that have turned the thinking men of the earth to look upon it with fear. These things are not going to lessen. They're not going to get better from 2020 forward, from COVID-19 forward. You can expect worse and worse until the passing of a national Sunday law where the nations of the world, beginning with America, are going to seek to restore national prosperity, seek to restore universal prosperity. And in so doing, beloved, that act of national apostasy will be swiftly followed by national ruin, because they have cut themselves off from righteousness. They don't understand the issues as it really is. And as Seventh-day Adventists, beloved, you and I have the responsibility, we are accountable, to give the trumpet a certain sound in this final generation. Dare I say, in this final midnight watch. Continuing. And then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared, beloved, that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. Give me another word for that. National Sunday Law that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. Do you see, beloved, that the enforcement of Sunday worship in America and then the world is intimately connected with these climate disasters? Yes, it is, beloved. Yes, it is. And that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their keyword restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Beloved, I want you to know that in this final generation, in this generation of restoration, God has a restoration plan. And Satan, through the image of the beast, has a restoration plan, but only one really restores. Only one truly restores, but both are going to happen in the generation of restoration. We have come to that point, beloved. We have come to that point. From the World Economic Forum, beloved, we are told that urgent climate action is needed to have emissions by what year? 2030. Now that's interesting, because according to the time of redemption, beloved, there is approximately eight years left. Not a definitive thing, meaning it can be less than that, it can be more than that in the plan of redemption, but there is approximately eight years left, which would bring us down to about the year 2031. What are they talking about here, beloved? What do the thinking men see? Remember, they see, but they don't understand. They can look at it, but they don't know what it means. Urgent climate action needed to have emissions by what year? 2030. They said that emissions must peak by 2025 to limit global warming and reduce by 43% by the year 2030. Now those are two different dates that we have spoken about during the course of this series. Continuing, climate clock, the most important number in the world. In the New York Times, it says a New York clock that told time now tells the time what? Remaining, beloved. 
to prevent the effects of global warming from becoming what? Irreversible. On Saturday, Metronome adopted a new ecologically sensitive mission. Now, instead of measuring 24-hour cycles, it is measuring what two artists, Gan Golan and Andrew Boyd, present as a critical window for action to prevent the effects of global warming from becoming irreversible, beloved. They're talking about a land uninhabited. On Saturday at 3.20 p.m., messages including the Earth has a deadline or a limit began to appear on display. From CNN, we have 10 years to save Earth's biodiversity as mass extinction caused by humans takes hold, United Nation warns. That was written in the year 2020, meaning that they're talking about an extinction event by the year 2030. Now, beloved, I'm not saying that these thinking men have the definite time. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is that what the thinking men are saying lines up with the approximate time revealed to us from inspiration and the word of God. Beloved, we are in the generation that shall see Jesus come. We are in the generation that shall see the end of the day of atonement. We are approaching what the United Nations calls mass extinction, but what the Bible calls a land uninhabited. Are you understanding the evidences, beloved? Throughout this series, we have given you four different uh, witnesses, beloved, to the fact that we are the final generation. Four different witnesses. If you don't believe one, you could believe two. If you don't believe two, you could believe three. If you don't believe three, here we are at four. Beloved, if you don't believe four, I have no more to give you. I have no more to give you. We have studied and we have gone through this thing so that we may see, beloved, our need for Christ at this time. That we would see, beloved, we have come to the generation that has the greatest need of understanding the character of God accurately. The greatest need of having a thirst for a close, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. Now, my question is, beloved, did Jesus see this coming? We're closing right here. In the book of Matthew 24, verses 21 to 22, Jesus said, For then shall be great tribulation. What is he talking about with great tribulation, beloved? He's talking about a time of trouble such as never was, at the close of human probation. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, beloved, there should no flesh be saved. Do you see that? But for the elect's sake, who are the elect, beloved? The 144,000. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. In other words, Jesus comes back just in time to receive a living body from the earth because had any time continued beyond that point, no flesh, no inhabitants on this earth would be saved. None would survive. Because man is destroying the planet, beloved. L look at this next quotation from Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which do what? Destroy the earth. Beloved, I want us to understand that Jesus foresaw this extinction. Jesus foresaw this land uninhabited at the end of the Day of Atonement because he understood the plan of redemption. Jesus understood the plan of salvation, beloved. He understands the restoration plan. It is he that implemented it. It is he that is the center of the entire thing. He is the lamb that supplies the blood, that dying lamb, amen? He is that living priest that applies the blood, the merits of that blood, amen? And he is the living priest who is coming back as a reigning king for all those who submit to him in this anti-typical day of atonement. Beloved, I pray with all that is in me that this series has been of great benefit and opening of your eyes to you and your family members. I pray, beloved, that we recognize that we are not just any generation at this time. We are the final generation. We are the limit generation. We are the generation of restoration, the generation that Every generation prior to this point has looked to and has expected to come. We are the generation 
that Jesus is depending on to finish this great controversy at long last. Beloved, the series has come to its close, but the work has in no wise come to an end yet. We have a great work to do in this final year of the Midnight Watch. During our last study, we saw that it is Satan's determined purpose to eclipse the view of Jesus. And I told you, beloved, here at Clear Distinction Ministries, our desire is to frustrate that determined purpose. We are even more determined to end the eclipse by lifting up the man Christ Jesus, that by beholding him, all who would look and live might become changed. Beloved, we want to increase the views of Jesus. And so during last study, I told you that I was going to be announcing the series that is going to follow this one. Beloved, I want to introduce to you Operation Midnight Sun. We're going to focus all 2024, all of this last year of the Midnight Watch on the man Christ Jesus in all of his glory. We want to receive the teacher of righteousness according to God's idea of righteousness, God's idea of his character. What does the life of Jesus say about the character of God? What did he demonstrate? Beloved, irrespective of what you may think God looks like at this time, if it is not in accordance with the life demonstrated by Jesus, beloved, we are going to fail to reflect his image fully at the passing of a National Sunday Law. We need the Son of Righteousness to arise with healing in his wings at uh, just moments before midnight in this final midnight watch. And so in this following series, beloved, we're going to take a look at Jesus. We're going to consider Jesus. We're going to examine Jesus. And we're going to do it again and again and again until the picture is evidently clear and distinct by the grace of God. We want to know Jesus. We want a close, intimate, and personal relationship with him. I want you to know, beloved, that there are many things we're going to be doing in 2024. Also, uh, my wife, Sister Punch, and I will be launching a podcast series called The Punch Pack Podcast, where we're going to be focusing, beloved, on preparing the home for the second coming of Jesus, ripening our families for the second coming of Jesus. Beloved, we need to understand this thing. God declares the end from the beginning. In the beginning, when God wanted to explain who he was, he made a family. And in the end, beloved, in order to reveal his character, it's going to take a family completely submitted to the righteousness of Christ. I pray that you keep our family in prayer as we're preparing these things, beloved. I don't have a definitive date for you yet for when they begin, but before we are out of this year, 2023, expect Operation Midnight Sun to be in full effect. We're gonna be looking at the man Christ Jesus, full in his wonderful face until the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We love you, we're praying for you. Maranatha, from our family. Thank you.